Oh my gosh. Okay, now that I've finally cleared myself out, I hope we can actually get on with this. Yes, you're right. You see miniatures and maps and dice, which means I'm going to demonstrate stuff. Uh, because that's what we do with these live streams, is that we actually answer questions and we demonstrate what you need to know. So this is why we have this here. Uh, for those of you who have not been part of this before, this is an ongoing program that I've been running uh, with the hope that I can get more people playing the game and uh, therefore there'll be more people uh, forming groups and feel free and comfortable about uh, joining what I consider to be one of the best games in the world which is Dungeons and Dragons, and certainly other roleplay games are really good as well. Um, but this is the reason why I do this class. Okay, so <clears throat> you're seeing this, but I also have a camera for my face. So don't, <clears throat> pardon me, don't freak out if you think you won't see my face in this, because that certainly will happen at some point. Um, now, let me just make sure that everything is working correctly. I can pull out the plug. My earplugs are definitely working today. Uh, so... What the plan is for today is, I'm going to do a slideshow, I'm going to present a whole lot of stuff, explain some stuff, sort of the more complicated aspects of combat uh, that you play in Dungeons and Dragons 5e. So slideshow first, and when I've finished doing that, I will then move on to Q&A or questions and answers. I will be jumping between my camera on my face to the camera on the, uh, the map so I can actually demonstrate stuff. And I will probably also have to jump between D&D uh, &D Beyond. So to, to reference uh, rules, I will do that as well. So there's a lot of jumping around going on to explain stuff so that you get what you need. My advice to you is, answer the poll. If you have a question, put the question in. And when I finish the presentation, I'll work my way through that list and answer everything if I can. Uh, there'll be some questions I can't answer, but I'll do my very best. Okay, now that we've done that and, and covered all the basics uh, before entering the, the, actual, the actual thing, let's, uh, let's get on to the, uh, the, the presentation for today. Now, where is this? That's here. Yeah. <clears throat> I will apologise now. I am having to... I still can't get rid of whatever's uh, attacking me, and so I will sound a bit funny and croaky at times. Hi, welcome to How to D&D. <coughs> Sorry, I'm starting again. A drink of water. Hi, welcome to How to D&D. My name is Fred Weller and today I want to talk about Dungeons and Dragons. I'm not talking about chess, even though it kind of looks like that. No, this is the Dungeons and Dragons 5e rules and I'm doing Lesson 3, Complex Combat Mechanics. That's the stuff that's not simple, that's a bit more complicated. I haven't covered that um, yet, and so that is what I'm going to do today. Now, I usually do an overview, so what am I going to cover? Well, first off, we're going to be covering the hide action in combat. What is a readied action in a battle? How does grapple work in a fight? What makes a shove different from a grapple? And cover the three different types of cover available to you in the game. Death saving throws, of course, for your characters and your monsters. And then some miscellaneous recommendations that I have for you uh, regarding uh, any kind of play that you engage in. My objectives are to explain everything. I will try to demonstrate as much as I possibly can. But I also want you to participate, so feel free to do so. All right, let's get started. D&D Beyond actually has the basic game mechanics for free available on their website and you can go and download it. You don't have to pay anything. So if you wanted to play the game, you can. Most of what you need to get started is there. Freely available. Do not need to pay a cent. You just need to have access to the internet. So let's deal with the first action that we have and that is the hide action. If you get confused by the hide action, that's all right, because it actually is quite complicated. It's not easy. The hide action requ requires your main action, whether it be a character or a monster usually, and you will use that to actually attempt to hide. Um, now, what this does is it makes you unseen from your foe. So whoever your enemy is, you will be unseen. Now, you need to be able to hide in something, okay? What you would do is you would make a dexterity or stealth check, uh, 
If there's something you can hide in or behind, it's going to work better. There are situations that may arise de determined by the dungeon master where they may require you not to have some sort of cover or something to hide behind. Say if you're sneaking up behind somebody and we're not using facing rules, then maybe you would um, apply the hide action. But usually in combat, there needs to be something for you to actually hide in. And if you don't have that, then it won't be successful. The next action is the readied action. This is also very difficult to understand. The readied action requires you use your main action again on your turn. So this can be for a character or a monster. Uh, and you're using your reaction. So you burn up your action, but you're actually going to take your turn as a reaction on somebody else's turn. And it's based off a stipulated trigger. So you have to actually state what you're going to do. It can be any of the things that are listed as an action, or it could be just movement, if you wanted to just move, okay? And you need to do this, <laughs> uh, you need to do this before, before you actually wind up making your action. So make sure you state what your trigger is, okay? When you decide to make the ready to action, you can't just say, I'm taking a ready to action. You need to state exactly what it is that will trigger the ready to action. Now you can move and then take a readied action. So if you want to use up your 30 feet of movement, if that's what you have, and then use your action to take the readied action, you can do this. And that's fine. That's not a problem. Right, so that's the readied action. You're probably going to come across this when you're dealing with goblins and things that can hide and cover. Um, other than that, you probably won't come across it too often. Let's hope anyway. The grapple action. Another quite complicated uh, mechanic, probably not the worst of them, but there's a lot of different aspects to it and it can be confusing. Grapple is a special melee attack that stops a creature's movement. If the contest between your strength or athletics check succeeds on the target creature's strength, athletics or dexterity acrobatics check. Okay, and they're trying to resist you trying to grab onto them. They're trying to resist the hold. What you will notice is that when you do this, when you are trying to apply the grapple, you must use strength or athletics as the check. You do not get to use acrobatics or dexterity. But if you are resisting and trying to get out of the grapple that's being applied to you, then you can use athletics, strength or dexterity acrobatics. So it's not exactly the same. When would you use this? Well, essentially if you don't want the creature to run away and you want to stop them moving. That's probably the only time you would use it because it doesn't offer any other benefits other than that. The next action, very similar to the grapple action in terms of how it works, but it has a different effect, and that is the shove action. Now the shove action works like this. It is a special melee attack that either knocks a creature prone or push, pushes the creature five feet away. Now, you will again use the same mechanic as the grapple. It's a contest between whoever's trying to use the shove, you use your strength or athletics check, that's what you have to use, and the target gets to use their strength athletics check or their dexterity acrobatics check to resist the force of being shoved. When would you use this? When you want to push a creature off the side of a building, into a fire, when you want to change their position, and that would be an advantage to you in some way. That's usually when you're going to be using the shove action. Next, let's cover cover. Let's cover cover. That's right, cover. We need cover. Cover makes us live longer in Dungeons and Dragons. Cover can make it more difficult for an attack to hit, or for a spell to affect the character, or the monsters. It can be any one of those. So half cover, this is when half of the body of the creature is covered, allows you to have a plus two bonus to your armor class, or a plus two bonus to, to your dexterity saving throw if a dexterity saving throw is involved. It does not affect any other saving throws, only dexterity saving throws, and only armor class. Three quarters cover, this is when three quarters of your body is covered, grants you a plus five bonus to armor class and a plus five bonus to a dexterity saving throw. Now total cover means that the creature can't be targeted by attacks or spells 
because you can't see the creature at all. You are completely unseen. You're completely covered. That's why it's called total cover. There are exceptions where you could be affected by a, uh, an attack, and that is only generally if there is an area effect attack that circumvents cover. Not all area effect uh, attacks or spells will circumvent cover or total cover, but some do. So that's how cover works in the game of Dungeons and Dragons. And then finally, the last mechanic, probably the one that I get the most questions about, and probably for good reason, and that is the death saving throw. Because the death saving throw is not your standard death saving throw. It is not like any of the other um, saving throws. A death saving throw is performed at the start of a character's turn, not at the end of their turn. So that means that you perform this at the start of your turn. You do not usually use a death saving throw for a monster. And you only do it if your character has zero hit points and they're not dead. Okay, There is a point at which you have zero hit points and you are classified as dead. But there's also a point when you reach zero hit points when you are just dying. So unless you take an enormous amount of damage that would outright kill you instantly, and this is usually when you take damage that would force you down minus um, your maximum hit points. So imagine you had 50 hit points and you took 100 points of damage. That would push you down to minus 50, which means you are instantly dead. But if that doesn't happen, you are just dying. So what do we have to do with the death saving throw? All you do is pick up one 20-sided dice and you roll that dice. And that's all you need to do because this is what is going to determine whether you live or die. You, If you roll a 10 or higher, that counts as one success. Okay, You are successful once. If you roll a 9 or less, you have failed and you have one failure. If you roll a 1, that is counted as two failures. And if you roll a 20, you have not just succeeded, you are now on one hit point. You are now no longer unconscious, you are conscious. Now we're going to tally up and keep a record of all the failures and successes that you get on your death saving throw. Because when you get three cumulative successful death saving throws, you are stable, but you are not conscious. So you won't need to make any more death saving throws when you have three successes. And you need to get them before you get three consecutive cumulative failures. Okay, If you get three cumulative failures before three successes, your character dies. And it's time to look at making a new character or trying to find a way of bringing them back to life. And that is how death saving throws work in the game. Now, like everything that I do on this channel, I always have some miscellaneous recommendations that I have for you. And I again have some for today. And that is, when, on sh when unsure what to do, I want you to either apply an ability check, a skill check, an attack roll, or a saving throw to determine if whatever the player character or the monster is trying to do will work. So if, if it's not covered by the rules, that's all you need to remember. Does it make sense that we make an ability check, or a skill check, or an attack roll, or a saving throw? And you pick the one that seems most appropriate, and that's what you use. Otherwise, if you're not going to be rolling dice, if the situation seems like whatever they're doing is going to be pretty successful, in other words, it seems like it, it would be easy to achieve, give them automatic success. If they suggest something that really would make no sense that it would work, then give them automatic failure. Okay, so if you want to harpoon the moon and pull it down to earth, then of course you're not going to roll dice. You're just going to say it's not effective. And that's really it. There isn't too much else that I want to cover in terms of the complex uh, nature of Dungeons and Dragons, but I don't want that to stop you asking me questions and giving me feedback. What I would like to say is don't get caught up in the rules. The rules aren't the only thing that are important to Dungeons and Dragons. I know some people feel differently about that. So ask your questions in the comments section, give your feedback, and hey, till next time, keep rolling those 20s. Just give me a second while I, um, I shuffle myself over. I'm going to go to my face cam before we start doing some demonstration today, okay?
and um, <clears throat> that is going to go there, that is going to go here, and we go back to our camera, which is hopefully going to catch up with us. Um, now, somebody asked me last week a question about uh, the Paladin's Divine Smite and two-weapon fighting, and I will answer the question today. Okay, uh, for those of you who don't know, the best way to support this program continuing week after week is on Patreon, where you get everything that I put up for free there, and to ensure that these continue, uh, not, uh, not just for today, but into the future. Okay, that's the best way to do that. Otherwise, Super Chats and Super Stickers are also um, appreciated. Let's have a look at the chat and the, uh, the, the question. I put a question and I said, do you have a question about Dungeons & Dragons 5e rules? We got 20% said yes, no for 10%, maybe 30%, just watching 40%. So that's out of 10 votes. That's fine. Cool. So those of you who have questions, start putting your questions in now. And some questions I will just answer with the, the head cam, okay? And some questions I'm going to go, I'm going to use the, uh, the battle um, grid and uh, the mat and, uh, map and, and miniatures, uh, but not for everything. Hello, Blade Roberts. Blade Roberts is a patron. I recognize the name. Welcome. Um, he supports me so I can keep doing this every week. Um, am I going to make a video on Ravenloft one shot? Also help hope you are, uh, you are well. Hey, are you going to are you going to make a video of, of the Ravenloft one shot? Also help. So 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 Blade Roberts. Um, he, here's the thing. I did a live stream that talked about how to run Ravenloft as a one shot. That's what you're talking about, correct? Now that that live stream is, is there. It, it should not be hidden. You should be able to find it. If you can't find it, you'll let me know. But it, it's there. It has been created. Um, did I make an edited version of that? Yes, I did. And yes, it is in 4K. Uh, have I released it yet? No, I haven't. Will I release it? Yes, I will. I don't know that I necessarily will release it this week, but there's a good chance it will be released at the beginning of next week because it is sitting in the pipe to be released. So does that, does that answer your question, Robert? Uh, hopefully it does. Um... <clears throat> Hello, Nick. Dinner Lion, Dinner Lion, Nick. We're going to go with Nick. You said to call you Nick, so how's it going? Um, thanks in advance for the uh, content. We are always glad to hear your insights. Well, that's good. I'm glad. I haven't seen too many questions so far. Um, I'm hoping that people will pose some difficult questions for me, things that will require me to go and do some research maybe, uh, or even, even have to look a few things up. You never know. Okay, can you move plus bonus action and then ready your main action to use use as a, a reaction later on? So Nick, yes you can. Yes, you absolutely can. So if you have a move, and you move say 30 feet, and you have a bonus action that allows you to do something, now um, as long as the bonus action is not related in any way to the action, Okay, so it needs to be able to be separated. So if you're trying to do two weapon fighting and you want to take a movement and then you want to use your offhand attack with two fit weapon fighting because you've got two light weapons in your hand, you're going to use your bonus attack to make an attack. So if you move two weapon fighting, bonus attack, attack somebody, and then you're ready the main action to attack under some circumstance or trigger, that won't work. But yes, you can go move and take your bonus action and then use your action to ready something else. Yes, that is definitely possible. Uh, <clears throat> Jean-Paul is one of uh, my mates who plays with me every week. How are you doing? Uh, looking forward to your Ravenloft one shot in a few weeks. Ah, so yes, I didn't mention that, did I? Um, I'm going to be running Ravenloft as a one-shot for my own home group. I'm not actually the dungeon master right now, believe it or not, people. I actually play more than I dungeon master. I know that might be strange, <clears throat> uh, and certainly from the views that you hear from me, you will probably think that I was dungeon master-centric, when in fact I actually play as a, a player character more than I dungeon master nowadays. Now, one, this is to keep me alive. <laughs> It takes a lot of time to run a YouTube channel, 
and it also takes a lot of brain resources. And the last time I did not um, look after myself properly and you burn out. So now I, I stagger it. Time three. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so uh, Nacho Nacho Man. Nacho Nacho Man is also a patron. Welcome. He also supports me on Patreon and I really do appreciate that his, his support. Okay, so what do you got here? What's your best advice for teaching new players how to use other actions than just attack? My advice is don't 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 teach them the combat rules. Like seriously, just don't teach them the combat rules. Don't even give them a cheat sheet. Just say what do you want to do? And when they figure out in their head like what makes sense to do under the circumstances, then you explain to them the mechanics for doing that. I find that with new players, that's probably the easiest way to get them to do something outside of the box. Because otherwise, they, there is a tendency, <clears throat> pardon me, there is a tendency to just press the buttons, you know. We've got the player's handbook, and in the player's handbook, under the combat chapter, there are certain actions, and we just press those buttons every time we want to do something. And that's not really a great game to be playing, if you ask me. Because again, Dungeons and Dragons is not, not chess, people. Uh, <laughs> I can assure you, it is, it is not chess, and it, it is not a tabletop war game. I, am a, I come from playing tabletop war games, and I can assure you, it is nothing like it. It, it was a response to it. It was a rebellion against tabletop wargaming. So, yeah, yeah. It may have got its roots there, but it, but that's not what it is. Okay. <clears throat> that would be my advice. Big Clue. Hello, Big Clue. How are you? Yes. So, let's, let's have a little discussion around that question that was posed. Two-weapon fighting and the smite ability that the paladin has. So, I have... Uh, pulled up D and D Beyond since I now have access to this thing, and let me just scroll through to the Smite ability so that I can uh, <laughs> I can highlight where this starts to lead. Now I I am not fond of people who play games who have an argument with their dungeon master or the players, but particularly when you have an argument with your dungeon master about how they are adjudicating the rules, I do not want to be the person in the middle uh, that gets in the way of how they run their game. Uh, so I may want to make that clear now. So if you want to use me in that way, don't please. All right. So let's uh, let's go over to the screen so you can see this section where it is this thing window display window capture is not coming up why is that there we go this is it this is what we want <clears throat> so this is the question that came up last time and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight uh, what we're dealing with here yep <clears throat> Now, the, the concept of two-weapon fighting. So the question was posed, can a paladin do two-weapon fighting and smite? Now, if we have a look at the smite rules, starting at level two, when you hit a creature with a melee attack, you can expend one spell slot to deal radiant damage to that target in addition to the weapon's damage. Okay, that's pretty clear. The extra damage is 2d8 for every first level spell slot, and you get an additional or plus 1d8 for each spell slot higher than level 1, to a maximum of 5d8. Okay. The damage increases by 1d8 if the target is an undead or a fiend, to a maximum of 6d8. So we know that we can only ever get 6d8 if we're attacking undead and fiends but if we're not attacking them we can only go as high as 5d8 so what this means is if we move and we then take the attack action uh, but we have two light weapons say two short swords and we make our off our, our, our main hand attack we do we can if we hit 
We can also smite, which means we do the weapon damage from the short sword, and we also do an, an additional 2d8 if we spend one first level slot. But if we are two weapon fighting and we attack with our offhand as well, which we would be, and we hit, we can also smite on that attack as well. <laughs> I know you're starting to think that seems like it's going to be busted. So that means potentially you can have two attacks and apply smite to both the main hand attack and the off hand attack getting anywhere between whatever your strength modifier is added to a six sided dice for your short sword the first attack the second attack would not have your modifier for strength added it would just be a six sided dice but you're going to ultimately if both attacks hit you're getting an additional 2d8 for each attack so that's 4d8 it's quite a lot of damage but to do so, we must spend two first level spell slots. So it can be done. <clears throat> okay, let's go back to uh, my face until we get a question that all requires using the map. If we run out of questions, people, I am just going to go and start doing some demonstration, okay? <clears throat> right. Right. Next question here. Um, I, I found it. I found it the hard way. Hard way. As soon as as you put down a battle mat, fight is it's fight time. Yes. Okay. So <clears throat> that's true, Nacho. Uh, absolutely. So if 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 you have just yourself and you're talking to your players, and you're describing something. That's fine. The chances are the conversation may turn, it might turn into a fight, but it might turn into a social interaction. As soon as you start to lay out a battle mat like I have here, and miniatures and dice with a grid, players go into combat mode. It doesn't matter what you are saying anymore. In fact, you might as well not say anything. In fact, the only thing you're probably um, worthwhile saying at this point is roll initiative. Because you have just triggered to them, no matter what I do, there's going to be a fight. Now, for those people who are like myself, who love to kill monsters, <laughs> so if you're dealing with a, a, a hack and slash, a slayer, a power gamer, power gamers tend to prefer combat, okay? There are people who aren't power gamers who just like combat and that's it. But they don't optimize their characters, um, or they don't know how to do so, or they don't care about that. They just want to fight. Okay, they get it, they're letting off steam. You put this out, you've just given them their their drug that they were looking for. Okay, their gaming drug is the battle mat and the battle grid. Some players do not like playing theater of the mind, and they will insist on a battle grid. In my group, we have somebody like that. Um, we have others who do not care and others who like a mix. I use a mixture of theater of the mind and the battle grid. You can see here, here are the players laid out. Here are my goblins hiding, apart from this one that's moved. Stay where you're supposed to. Uh, but yeah, as soon as you lay that out, we go straight into combat mode. So yeah, just bear that in mind. If you if you don't want it to be go into combat and you want to have a chance to turn into something else, then don't put miniatures or maps out. <laughs> okay, all right. Next, um, Blaze, uh, it's, a, it's a Blaze Bull Eyes, Bull Eyes Killer. I'm just going to call you Blaze. Welcome, Blaze. I'm, I'm glad that you enjoy what I'm doing. If it has been helpful to you, Blaze, and it is helping you play the game and somebody around you that plays the game, great. Um, I'm happy. This is good news. This is why this exists. We do this every week. Every week, I mean, whether it's the basic rules, the basic combat um, mechanics, the complex um, aspects of combat mechanics, or next week where we, we cover magic, hopefully my slideshow will be ready by then, um, every week one of those four will be run. And um, it's not limited because once we get to Q&A, anything goes, right? We can cover anything you need to cover. Um, of course within the, the restrictions of my, my knowledge base. <laughs> okay. All right. Jean. Hello, Jean. How are you? 
What's the damage for holding something uh, to a, a lit um, brazier, like a medium-sized fire pit um, on a stand? I believe a brazier is one hit point. Um, I think it's the same as a torch. Now, where is that information, um, Jean? Hello, um, Dungeons and Chronics. Uh, pardon me. Uh, look, look, just give me a second. See if I can find what you're looking for. Because you probably want the entry. I don't want to flip through the book as such. Um, but let's see if I can go to the player's handbook. Is it under equipment or is it under adventuring? I can't remember. There's, I know there's a section where, where it actually stipulates what you're talking about. So um, let's, uh, let's see if I can just scroll down and find. Bear with me. Sing a song, people, while I'm doing this. Um, or ask more questions. More questions mean I get to answer more stuff. Yep. <laughs> uh, but I'm pretty sure a torch does one point of damage. And so I think a brazier is kind of considered the same. I don't know if it necessarily says that in the rules, though. That's that's That would be, I guess, the... The only hassle is because if it doesn't say it specifically, you don't have a reference point of being, that's the absolute definitive answer. But let me just scroll on down here and I think I can find Torch. And I'm pretty sure that the, um, the flame off a Torch is considered about the same as a what you're talking about, Torch. Here we go. Um, right, here we go, yes. It is. There it is. Um, this is what I was looking for. So just let me just flip over to that page so I can show it to you and you can see it on D&D Beyond. I, yeah, as I said, I don't believe that there is a section that stipulates exactly um, what a brazier will, uh, a lit blaze, brazier will do, but I am pretty sure that you would consider um, a torch very similar. Um, so that's, uh, that's why I'm referring you to this section. So this is what it says. Uh, if you have a brazier that is lit, I would deem it as a torch, and it says here, a torch burns for one hour, providing bright light in a 20-foot radius and dim light for an additional 20 feet. If you make a melee attack with a burning torch and hit, it deals one fire damage. Now, if you have a very large brazier, then of course the amount of damage it can do is, is going to be greater. But I would say use one fire damage or roll a four-sided dice. Do you remember the cal um, the cal caltrop? You know, the very really spiky one. You know what I'm talking about. I would just roll that and treat it as an improvised weapon, okay, or an improvised attack of some kind. And since the improvised rolls usually use a 1d4 as the default, or you change that to whatever you think um, it fits. Um, so if you have a larger brace, you say it's a large size, maybe you would up it to a d6. That would be my advice to you when trying to figure out how much damage a brazier does. Okay, uh, let's go back to me uh, again. And um, I haven't had a question that required the battle mat yet, which is surprising. But I'm sure we'll get there. Um, Jean, you'll tell me if that question did not get answered to your satisfaction. Okay. Uh, what else we got here? Improvised caltrop. Yeah, uh, we're not. Look, I'm talking about the four sided dice. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, okay, so what do you got here, Jean? Um, I would just dis disregard the um, play uh, the playing area. It doesn't exist until uh, yeah, unless the DM said it's there. Exactly. You don't know what they exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> right, um, now the reason I know how much damage the, the torch does in terms of fire damage is because recently my group, it popped up and I believe one of my mates knew exactly what the answer was, because he had done it before, um, <laughs> and I believe that I had adjudicated that he could use sneak attack with the, um, the torch, uh, so yeah, something that you're not apparently supposed to do, but <laughs> we did it that day, um, he stuck it in a good part in the eye. <laughs> Jean, um, what's it burning through coal or something else? It would um, last a few. Yeah, 
so I, like I said, I would say just consider it like a, a torch. Okay. Oh, so Nacho Nacho Man. Sorry, your, your question. You want to know when I'm creating monsters next, correct? My understanding is we have just finished this week uh, lesson six. So lesson, lesson seven is creating skill challenges. Um, so we will create a skill challenge. And what I will do is I'll put out a question. Uh, I'll sort of say, I'll put out a, a poll asking people what sort of skill challenge they would like me to make. I'll give you a couple of options and then we'll build that. So that will be coming next week. What day is that for you? It depends on where you are in the world. So for me, it will be Monday in New Zealand, which would be Sunday in North America. Okay, Nacho Nacho Man, that's when it would be. I'm going to put up tomorrow, I'm going to give you a, a really a good schedule um, of exactly when things happen. Um, so one of the one of the things that will happen after that Monday, which is Sunday for you, um, it would be Tuesday for me in New Zealand, but Monday for North America, and that will be world building will be the, the next day after. That will be Dungeon Master preparation. We've been doing two Dungeon Master preparations per week right now, which is far more than I wanted to do because it actually is hard to keep up with. <laughs> Uh, and it's hard for me to make sure that I can give you a document that I feel satisfied with. Although I try not to mess with it because it's kind of your creation. Um, and then the day after that will be probably beginner character creation would be on, oh, what day is it? It would be Wednesday for me, Wednesday for me and Tuesday for North America. And that would be probably beginner character creation beginner character creation for the cleric and then on Thursday for me and uh, which is Wednesday for you in North America that would be because I'm in New Zealand um, that would be uh, the magic yeah so magic mechanics so you're casting magic it'll be the it'll be one of these sessions but we'll be covering magic instead of other stuff um, and hopefully the slideshow is ready for that so that's kind of what we've got. What time would it be? For me in New Zealand, that will be uh, 12 p.m. noon. If you are in North America, that it's Pacific Standard Time. So if you're in Los Angeles, it would be 4 p.m. If you are in Mountain Daylight Time or Standard Time or whatever it's called uh, over in North America, that would be 5 p.m. If you are in, is it, is it in Chicago? Central Daylight Time or Standard Time, I'm not sure which one it is right now, uh, then it would be 6 p.m. And if you are in Florida, Mel uh, Miami, Florida, Miami, the East Coast, uh, East, EM, is it East Daylight Time or East Standard Time, it's 7 p.m. Okay, all right, my God. I'm trying to remember all this stuff, it's very hard for me, okay? You're in New Zealand like you. Okay, thank you, Nacho Nacho Man. So you, yeah. So you'll find that everything that I do is always at 12 p.m. because I run from 12 p.m. noon when hopefully the house is empty. <laughs> and then I stop at 2 o'clock and then I have to go to work and then I come back very late. <laughs> so, so that's how I've been running uh, these courses. It's the only way. I've got to make sure there's not too many kids running around, not too much noise going on. So that's how I, I operate right now. Okay, so um, I've answered that question. So monster creation, your actual question is, so what happens with these eight Dungeon Master preparations is we have an order to them. And, oh God, for the life of me, will I even be able to remember what that order is? I'm going to probably have to pull it up. Give me a second while I look at it. What it means is usually every month or two months, we roll around to the next class. Does that make sense? So you don't have to wait too long. So right now I am, so next week we'll have creating skill challenges and world building. And then after that will be adventure building and building non-player characters. And then after that, so probably about three weeks from now, we'll be building monsters and creating locations. So Nacho, Nacho Man, if you want to be part of that and you want me to just build the concept behind a monster, we can do that. Or if you want the, the the mathematics, then you need to let me know that you want to just focus on the stat block. Um, so that's how it works. Now my problem is, 
uh, is I, I do actually talk to AJ Pickett quite a lot because he's also a New Zealander. And um, AJ has asked me to do a video on his latest video, um, topic, the Incompatibles, which is a homebrew monster. And if you've ever had to go through his notes and try to figure out what to do with it, it's been a process. Uh, I know what AJ wants me to do, and I'm feeling like I might have to do it because I feel like my, my Friday is going to always be sucked up with this Unearthed Arcana 1D&D &D playtest stuff. And I don't want to do that. So there's a good chance I will run Monster Law once a week where I will talk about a monster because um, it's better for my health. I like it. AJ has, and, um, has said to me more than a few times, and he's probably right, that I need to stop doing videos about uh, just mechanics and um, trendy stuff, like the trend stuff. Like, And I, I get it, and I agree. Um, it's not good for my health. It's got not, not good for the channel because people don't necessarily look for it. So he's been trying to get me to do lore videos on monsters, which I could do every week if I really wanted to. Does that make sense? Um, AJ Pickett, AJ Pickett. Um, he has a YouTube channel, does monster lore ecology. Yeah, that's the guy. Right, now let me get back to the questions that we have here. Um, so Big Clue has a question, and I'm sorry I've taken so long to get to your question. But we're doing pretty well. Um, okay, all right. It's a good question. So which in-combat action besides attacking do you think is the most overlooked or underutilized um, option for players? The help action, the disengage action, the dodge action... Um, I think probably the most underutilized is none of those. I actually think that a lot of players struggle to come up with the concept of how can I do something that will really be beneficial and work, but it isn't covered by the rules. Because there's often quite a few different things they can do, but they are limited by their understanding of the game because they, they focus on the rule book and... They'll focus on it because they are used to playing video games where you are restricted. You can only do so much. If you fall in water, you die. Um, if you fall off a cliff, it's always tall enough to kill you. Uh, if you attack, you only ever attack a particular way, you know? So, yeah, I, I don't know. If I had to pick a specific mechanic that I think is underutilized, I would have to say it's probably the help action and the dodge action. I think disengage gets used far too much and dodge is probably far more useful to you but then again you know play style and how you build your character and how you prefer to play that's that's part of it so yeah that's i guess that's what my answer fender hello fender fender is a patron supports me on patreon i hopefully i've if, if you're a patron and i have not mentioned you uh i apologize fender is a patron supports me on patreon thank you <laughs> so you have it must be very very early where you are I know the last time you jumped into one of these it was extremely early I was feeling really bad about the fact that it was like in the wee wee early morning for you <laughs> but anyway let's uh, let's have a look at what you have to say your question uh, in combat do you ask the players to expend an action when they are attempting a skill check I know where this is going, Fender. Okay, I'm going to talk. Look, if, if it wasn't clear, I'm going to talk. Look, I will talk about the rules glossary that exists uh, for Unearthed Arcana 1D&D, &D, the expert class. That's happening tomorrow. I will, I will talk about all of that. No, I don't normally do this. I do not normally require an action to be used to use a skill. Um... And this is because that's how the 5e rules have sort of been set up. But if the 5e rules weren't set up that way, I would be inclined to decide what I thought required an entire action to use, uh, do perform a task, rather than it always has to be an action. I, I think it makes no sense. I feel like I'm already starting to talk about stuff I was going to talk about tomorrow. 
so don't get don't get don't get upset with I'm, I'm not upset with you fender i'm not upset with you i'll pose you one question so i'm going to pose you a question which i know all of you know the answer to straight away okay i'll pose you a question if you are in a battle and you have to make a skill check and it's always an action to do so what if you have to make a religion a history an arcana or a, um, a nature check to remember information you're making a knowledge check essentially do you think that should be an action does it take up your entire action to remember that information because you have to sort of stop and think oh i remember this rather than making an attack or casting a spell or doing something else that's my question to you i know that's not a fair thing to do to ask a question when you've asked a question but hence i'm going to be talking about this tomorrow anyway um throw a brick hello throw a brick your name is interesting um i hope you don't throw bricks through walls or well, you can't really do that can you but throw a window throw a window interesting name throw a brick <laughs> okay here we go have you ever used the charge action um does the defender setting a lance to defend against the charge have to win initiative and take the hold action one there is no such thing as the hold action now in dungeons and dragons 5e the charge action no i have never done that because there isn't actually a charge action uh there is the charge of feet but there isn't actually a charge action uh, we now have an action called the dash action which i can demonstrate very shortly if you like uh but no um i don't i think what you're talking about is a lot of stuff that's unrelated to D and D five E, and this is really about D and D five E. So if this is related to Pathfinder, I'm not going to be help you. I have played Pathfinder first ed edition, but I haven't played second the second um, version of Pathfinder, and I'm probably not going to. Um, anyway, hello, War Disguise, Disguise, Dis Disguise, War Disguise. Hello, uh, Nacho Nacho is on his break. Yes, good. Uh, Sammy 30, 3D. Hello, Sammy 3D. And welcome, War Dis 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 Guy. Dis Gaia. Dis Gaia. Dis Gaia. I'm, 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 I'm so sorry with your name. I am really am. <laughs> uh, facing and diagonal rules discussion. You want me to, oh my, I knew somebody would do this. You want me to cover moving diagonally, don't you? I knew somebody would. I will do that. It's not a good idea um but i will <laughs> i'm going to wait i'm going to wait seven more minutes when i take the break i'll come back with a ruler <laughs> and i will discuss movement and dungeons and dragons 5e and i will compare it to 3.5 diagonal movement because that i know that's where you're going right and facing there is no facing in dungeons and dragons really facing is determined by what the dungeon master wants to do in their game okay um, so we can come back to facing if you like, but I think that kind of answered it. Your diagonal rules discussion, Sammy 3D, I will do this. I've done this before on a live stream, so I, I know what to do, um, and I can do it again, not a problem. Uh, the bungee guy. I don't, I don't know about, I don't think AJ would consider himself the bungee guy. Seeker, hello Seeker. Man, it must be really early where you are uh finally caught up with the stream on fast speed oh my gosh really a few people behind it's all right not a problem shove uh either to knock a creature prone or push it away from you yes exactly that's exactly what it's supposed to do and that's what i described i'm pretty sure i did <laughs> uh okay so you have a question who decides if a monster does um, um goes prone or gets pushed away the pc or the dm it's very, very simple. Whoever was pushing the creature decides whether they go back five feet or they go prone. Now, um, I suppose this is another time where I probably need to reference the rules so that you can see it. That doesn't mean that a dungeon master could not adjudicate and change the way they work, but I don't know why they would do this. I don't think it would be... Um, 
I don't think it would actually add anything to the game that's, that, that, that needed to be there. Now, sometimes when we make decisions as dungeon masters, we do things that, frankly, are unnecessary. So let me just go back over to this screen capture. In fact, I will make my head a little bigger because apparently my head is pretty big. It's pretty big, people. It's pretty big. Let's, let's, get, let's get it to a little, little larger. And I'll take a drink of water. We'll bring you over. I think you can see everything fairly clearly there. So as I go through, it's, it should, shouldn't be difficult. And let's look at the shove action. Shoving a creature. So who gets to decide? The player or the dungeon master? And I think given the rules that we have for the game, it pretty much indicates to me that whoever is performing the shoving action decides whether the creature goes prone or they wind up going back five feet. So here we go. Using the attack action, you can make a speci special melee attack to shove a creature, either to knock it prone or to push it away from you. Now that's all it says, yeah? If you're able to make multiple attacks with the attack action, this attack replaces one of them. So you can potentially shove a creature more than once uh, with this. Now you'll notice that it doesn't actually state that the player or the dungeon master gets to do that. So I can see where you may have arguments cropping up in your game. But I think it makes sense that if you're going to perform this action, you would decide the way that you would do this, okay? The way that you apply pressure to push somebody is going to change the way that they go down. Now, the, the, now my rationale for this is not based on rules. My rationale on this is based off on the fact that I used to teach martial arts. Um, and I, I know you guys call it mixed martial arts now, but back when I was playing, uh, when I was involved in teaching, and, and, and part of that um, activity, it wasn't a sport for me, okay? Martial arts was survival. And so you would be taught how to punch, kick, headbutt, use elbows. So you, you were taught how to strike, but you were also taught how to throw. And I consider the shove action a type of throw. Now, if you go up to somebody and you just push on them, they're probably just going to go backward, Okay. To actually have them go fall on their on their ass and actually wind up prone, you usually have to apply a different type of pressure. You have to perform what is called a throw, because just a simple push usually does not result in a creature falling on their ass. So I consider the shove action uh, an attempt to duplicate the concept of throwing. And there are throws that move you backwards and pushing that moves you backwards and then there's um, pushing and shoving that actually knocks you on your ass and it usually means you have to place something behind their legs to destabilize them in some way okay or you need to be able to remove one of their supporting legs in some way so i always view shoving a creature like i am in, uh, engaging in throwing um, because if you've ever been involved in martial arts you know that before World War II, they did not dissect everything. You would learn everything. You would, you would learn how to strike, how to throw. You would learn how to grapple. You learned everything. You learned how to use weapons, whether you had weapons or fighting against weapons, unarmed, all that sort of stuff. It's one of the reasons why I like the monk so much is because it goes back to um, a part of me where I had to learn martial arts to survive in my world uh, at that time. But also, too, because it goes back to a streak where I like to punch people and, and knock them over. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's, that's my thing, people. Um, but, yeah, okay, let's, let's move on. But, yes, I, I can see where you might have come to the conclusion that it could be either the player or the dungeon master who makes that decision based off the wording. And, yes, it does, it does say, basically, you either... If you succeed, you either knock the target prone or you push it um, five feet away from you. But I think you just decide, the person decides what that's going to be. I think that was the intent. All right, let's go back to Q&A. And if I'm falling behind, I am sorry, people. I will try to be faster. 
Uh, Seeker, I've got your question sorted. Uh, Nacho, I want to reskin the black spider as a dryad. A dryder. Okay. You want to reskin the black spider as a dryder? Sure. How long have we got to do that? Because uh, <laughs> three weeks from now, it might happen. But again, if I wind up replacing one of the Dungeon Master preparation classes, it could take, it could take two months before we get there. Do you know what I mean? If I start talking about monsters. Um, I'm going to be... Uh, so, Nacho Nacho Man. I'm going to be on Discord uh, working on slideshows. So, I have a Discord. I don't know if I've told people about it. I will let you know. You can actually just come and talk to me, either using video chat or voice chat. Please don't try to text... Um, put, um, type in text messages and so forth into dis to Discord for me. I don't have time for that. I will be working, but you can talk to me either using video or voice chat and ask me questions. So I'll give you the link to this um, this place, and I will be there New Zealand time on Saturday, probably from about 1 p.m. through to about 5 p.m., uh, working very hard trying to get things done and so you are welcome to come and ask me questions if you're trying to do something like that if you want me to build it um, for you I think about it um, I still feel like it's probably not going to happen at the time in the time frame that you want anyway uh, let me just see if I can just find that got that let's put this into here That is my Discord, people. All right. Uh, Dungeons and Chronics. If you're um, blocked with a shield and have your sword out, can you attack also, or does that require another action? Ooh. Okay. I need to read that question a little bit more. That's um. It's got me a little bit stumped, actually, there. Y you may have thrown a, uh, a question at me that I don't know the answer to. Let me just read that again. Uh, by the way, Nacho Nacho Man, I think your idea of having a stat block that is a drider that was once the Black Spider is a really good idea. And so, <laughs> I mean, whether it happens in a timely manner, it's probably going to happen. Um, we'll probably wind up doing it. Yeah. I just don't know when. All right, I need some more water. Please don't let me forget. Oh, it's time to take a break. I'm going to go get my ruler. We're going to be back very shortly and I'll be I'll be talking about diagonal movement and movement in Dungeons and Dragons 5e because I know somebody is obviously wanting to ask that question so we will deal with that in a second. Um, let me just drop that there and go back to here. I'm going to get Arnold to look after you for just a second. I will be back. Um, I won't be long. So let me just go here, hashtag, keep asking questions. Five minutes and I'm back, okay?
All right, I'm climbing back into my space and I'm also grabbing some stuff. And I will be doing, oh, where are we? That's, that's that. Okay. Right, let's uh, let's move you back to our, the screen that we wanted. Um, all right, so we are about to go to our battle mat. Here we go. I said I would talk about uh, movement in Dungeons and Dragons Five E, so I will. Okay. Now we're going to assume that the character that we're going to use is going to be using 30 feet of movement. Okay, so everything that I describe will be using 30 feet of movement. We're going to move horizontally. So horizontal. We've got vertical movement, which is going to essentially wind up coming the same. And then we've got diagonal movement so diagonal movement uh, for 5e and then the discussion always winds up coming back to diagonal movement from Dungeons and Dragons 3.5 and I am going to measure with you and um, for you now I'm, I'm actually going to be using a scale ruler okay this is a scale ruler so let me just clear a few things out of the way just to make it a little bit easier for me to demonstrate this. So we don't need this right now, so I'll put that out of the way. We'll get rid of uh, this, because that's, well, do I want to use that? No, no I don't. I could, but I'm not going to do that. We're going to get rid of this, we're going to get rid of that, we're going to get the dice out of the way, so that it's not in the way, it'll put it over there, something like this, that'll do. Okay. And then um, we're going to clear some space. They're going to move themselves out of the way. And we're going to use a, a single miniature as my demonstration. So goblins, you just have to just move out of the way. Give them some space, people. Give them some space. Um, I don't know why my car didn't set the uh, camera to, to fix and lock the, um, lock the camera on it. Okay, so I apologize if the camera pops in and out. I did not expect that. I had forgot, forgotten to turn off the, the sodding... Uh, what do you call it? Uh, the zoom function, uh, the the autofocus. That's right, the autofocus. If I turned off the autofocus, it wouldn't be a problem. I don't think I can do anything with it while it's currently in use. No, uh, autofocus. Oh, I can actually. I don't know if that'll work. We'll see if that does. If it does, that's good. Autofocus coming into a plate. No, no, it has turned it off. Okay, <laughs> well that's awesome. Okay, so first off. Oh dear. So movement in Dungeons and Dragons 5e, I think, is probably one of the best things they've ever done. And the reason is, is they've actually made it really, really simple. And the reason they've made it really simple is because for years we've been messing around and doing silly things. Now they did this in Dungeons and Dragons 4e, um, and this seems to be a carryover from Dungeons and Dragons 3.5, where people believe that the way that you move uh, should be depicted by Pythagoras' theorem. Uh, now, there's nothing wrong with Pythagoras as a theorem, because it is correct, but Pythagoras did not measure in squares. And being a, uh, a wargamer originally, I know that the only way to actually correctly measure your distance is to be using a ruler. So I have what is called here a scale ruler. It's not a standard ruler, so it's going to be a bit hard. Every increment that you see here uh, right now that I'm going to show you is going to be classified as... Uh, metric, I'm using metric, and I will mark down each each time I do the measurement, okay, I'm going to be marking down the measurement for that movement. So here is our barbarian, and we move. So we're going to move 30 feet, and we're going to move vertically in this case. So from this point, and I'll put a marker here so we don't lose our position, when we actually measure our distance that we travel, okay, you need to be measuring from the same point on the miniature. So that means if we're measuring from the back of the miniature, we must, must measure from the back of the miniature again. Okay, so 
from that point, here we are. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. So each square represents a total of 5 feet. And each square is about 1 inch in reality, okay, which is about 24.1 or 5 um, millimeters, uh, if you're using metric. So if I measure this from the back of that miniature to there, which I will do right now, you will notice the distance is a grand total, since I'm measuring from that line to that line, so I'll just put that marker there, and I'll get that measurement off. That came out as a grand total of, da da da, here's my head, 15. Okay, so that's 15 centimetres. That is for vertical, 15 centimetres. Okay, that's about half the ruler. 15 centimetres. 15 centimetres is equivalent to um, 150 millimetres. And if we're going into metric, uh, into uh, imperial, uh, I can't remember what it is. I think it'll, it'll be six inches. So that'll be six inches, okay? That's, that's true. That's correct. That's fine. Okay, so now let's take this back again. And this time I'm going to measure and we'll go the other way. Now, it, it of course, should be exactly the same, right? So we move 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, because each square represents 5 feet. And we measure from the back, just like we did before, and it will come out identical as before. Okay, it's basically, I think in this case, it looks like the squares are slightly out, so it's, it's just over uh, 15 centimetres horizontally. So maybe the, the printing of this map is not absolutely perfect. Okay, so that's probably coming out at... I would say that's 15.3. 15.3 centimetres, which is 153 millimetres. Which is a little bit more than 6 inches on this grid. Just obviously there's some imperfections in terms of its layout and so forth but we're measuring correctly from where we are. So now let's look at diagonal movement. Diagonal movement has always been the biggest headache. So we're gonna be measuring from the back of the miniature. Now the back of the miniature we could count as the, the corner of the, um, the square or the back of the actual miniature. Okay, so that's, this is where our, our problem will tend to lie. So if we go from this point and we move diagonally, in Dungeons and Dragons 5e, we just move six squares or 30 feet. So it goes from here, 5, 10, so 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. There's our end point. So if I measure back from the back of the miniature, how much distance will be actually covered? Right, so I need to just move that ruler just about there. And it comes out at... Here we go, it's going to be uh, the back of the square is probably where we should be measuring from, which is that one there, to the back of that square. So it's going to be a little bit bigger, and you will we'll see how much it is, okay? That is 21.4. 21.4 centimetres which is 214 millimetres. So we've, we've essentially probably got an, almost an extra, um, I'd say, six, six centimetres of distance covered. Okay. All right, now let's go back to Dungeons & Dragons 3.5, where movement was, you would the first square you move is counted as five foot, the second square of movement is counted as 10 feet. So we'll do this. So first movement, we're going to be measuring from the back of the square, as be, um, back of the square on the corner, as before. 5, 15, because that's 10, 10 more feet, not 5, 15. Okay, so it goes 5, 15, 20, 30. There's where we are. And we're going to measure from the back of the, uh, the, the, the square, just like we did before, to the 
Right, here we go. This. So what is the actual distance travelled? 3.5, was it correct? Well, we have a 1, 4, and it's going to be a point here. It's very, very close. Yeah, there we go, 3. So that is, using diagonal movement for, from 3.5, we now classified it as 14.3 centimetres, okay, or 143 millimetres. So it's much closer than the diagonal movement for 5e. Here's the problem. If you have a map laid out and you're not just moving in a straight line and you are changing, you're moving around angles and so forth, you get wacky things happen. So yes, mathematically, it makes more sense that it's, it's similar to the distance that you move. But the biggest problem is that you're covering so much less in terms of squares. Let's think about where we were, okay? So this is, this is the distance we are covering. So we are, this is, this is 30, uh, that's 5, 10, 15, 20, Okay, so that's, yep, yeah, there we go. So there should be four squares. So we're four squares away. Now if we're using 5e and we've got a miniature that can move the same distance um, and six squares rather than the four squares we got from 3.5, here we go. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. That's how much difference there is in terms of how far you moved. That's the difference. The other problem is, if you take that um, that dice as our marker, if we are moving again 30 feet, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, you can see that as long as you move vertically and um, horizontally, you can always move further than you can uh, um, doing it this way. And this th that's a product of the fact that you're measuring in, in squares. So... I actually think the change to 5e was smarter, even if mathematically you do tend to wind up about right, and there does seem to be a slight advantage uh, in moving diagonally compared to 3.5. Um, so that's it. There it is. There's the maths for it. Okay, um, I'm going to go back to my uh, head cam, and uh, let's work our way through these, uh, these questions. Um, no, 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 yes, there, that should, that should have done it, we should be, we should be all good now, all right, um, 25.4, one inch, is it 25.4, it might be, it might be, I can't remember exactly, it'd be pretty close to that, <clears throat> now, uh, where are we, we are, we are dealing with the next question here, along a line of uh, many questions, I suspect. Oh, this is um, Dungeons and Chronics question. If you are blocking with a shield and have your sword out, can you attack also, or does that require another action? Well, your shield, if it is equipped, is going to give you an increase to your armor class. Are we? What are we talking about here? Blocking with your shield. Your shield will always block some of the impact of a blow because you get plus two to your armor class with a shield in 5e. Um, there isn't actually a block action that I know. I think what you're talking or referring to is the feet um, shield bashing. So there's a, isn't there a feat that allows you to do something with shields? I'm pretty sure there is. So I don't quite follow what you're you're trying to get at here, uh, with regard to the, the the shield. That might be a question I have to come back to in the in the future. Um, where is it? Is there? If I can find it, then maybe I can work my way through that. But I right now I don't. Ah, shield master. It'll be shield master that you're talking about, isn't it? Okay, well, let's let's go over to D and D Beyond then. Let's go back over there. <clears throat> uh, window over here. 
this is this feet. You're talking about the feet, aren't you? And your question was, um, if you block with your shield, can you use your sword and make an attack? Right. Well, let's have a look at what we've got here then. Shield Master, you use a shield, not just for protection, but also for offense. You can gain the following benefits while you are wielding a shield. Uh, if you, you can take the attack action on your turn and can use a bonus action to try and shove a creature five feet of you with your shield. Okay. All right, so, so in other words, you're essentially getting to use the shove action as a bonus action as far as I can tell. And you can shove, but you can't knock them prone. Okay, so that's fine. Uh, if you aren't uh, incapacitated, you can add your sh shield's AC bonus to your dexterity saving throw. Okay, all right. And you make uh, you make against a spell or other effect. Okay, that targets you. Fine. If you are subjected to an effect that allows you to make a dexterity saving throw to take only half damage, you can use your reaction to take no damage. As far as I can tell here, I think what you're, you're dealing with here is using the shield to shove somebody um, back, and I think that's what you're referring to, right? To sh to, to, this is what you're referring to as a block. If you don't decide to use your shield to, to, um, to shove them, then you're not using your bonus action to do that. It would just be the bonus to your armor class and your dexterity saving throw, right? But so if so, you could block and make an attack. That's not going to be a problem. If you're using your shield as in the attack action on your turn, you're now using it as a bonus action rather than as a, a main action. So that still leaves your action available to use for making an attack. So yes, you can use your shield to shove and then make an attack with your sword or whatever weapon you have in the other hand. So I don't think that would be a problem at all. I'm pretty sure that answers your question. But if you're just blocking, it, it won't matter. Because <laughs> you're just going to get that benefit no matter what anyway. All right? Oh, cool. Cool, 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 cool. Let's move over. Let's go back to the questions, uh, which there are many. Uh, big clue. Uh, to answer your question, no, if you can freely speak for six seconds you can certainly think for six seconds exactly my point big clue that's what i would think dead man fred tv it's been a while dead man and um, fred tv i know i know you um i know you've been around nice to have you here um natural natural man i made him a drider after the players killed him uh a matrach turned him into a Magic mirror thing I homebrewed. Mmm, interesting. Yes, I think this is where Big Clue wants to go, which I get. That's, that's cool. Not not a problem. I, I like the idea. I think it's a it's um a nice addition to what you're trying to do. Um, and yeah, absolutely, do something like that. It's it's, it's a good idea. Uh, it's just when would I have time to make the stat block? And right now I am, as I said, uh considering doing a lot more monster law and that would kind of eat into dungeon master preparation time um okay uh, blocking with a shield does not use an action wielding a shield merely adds here yeah. but yes if you're using it to try to shove somebody it will use your bonus action okay fender what do you got here I know the book says you have to use an action to search, perception, investigation check, but I met a DM who asked me to expend an action for recalling information or verbally interacting persuading checks. Okay, so, so Fender, I totally understand your frustration with having to use your action to do this. It's not my game, okay? I would not do that myself. I'm sure other dungeon masters wouldn't. I'm sure there are more dungeon masters other than that dungeon master who would do that. And 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 frankly, I, th I, I kind of think it's good when dungeon masters kind of make the rules their own and do something with it. Um, I, there, there are lots of things that I've done with rules and I've changed the way I've, I've done, done stuff uh, based off sort of feedback, but sometimes I realized it didn't make sense. 
you may well find that this dungeon master and what they're doing in the game will change over time because our journey is, is not the same. Do you know what I mean? We, we all move at a different speed. We all do things slightly differently and we're all trying to find our way. And we're dealing with how do you make a codified rule system essentially, that somebody adjudicates, that duplicates and simulates the real world mechanics of a fantasy world. You're not just dealing with real world mechanics, you're dealing with fantasy world mechanics. It's not an, a big, uh, it's a huge ask. It's not a big ask? No, it's definitely a big ask. It's a huge ask. Yeah. Seeker, thanks. Second question. Okay, here we go. There's another question coming. Good. I'm glad we've got these questions coming. Good. Good, 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 good. Uh, looks like I'm going to be able to answer a lot of these uh, without the battle mat at this point, which is fine. Second question. Would a PC next to me, when I shove a goblin five feet away, get an opportunity attack on the shoved cre um, um, goblin? No. It's forced movement. So here we go again. Let's go back. Uh, let's find opportunity attacks. Remember with your... When you're making an attack and, and getting a night attack of opportunity, there is there are some prerequisites for whether you get to um, make an attack against them. And with an opportunity attack, one of those requirements is you must be able to see the attack and you need to have some way of making an attack. But there is another thing that is actually listed here. Now let me just... Um, bring up the uh, the webcam and I'll show you what I'm talking about here. Here we go. Opportunity attacks. Uh, so the question is, if somebody uh, pushes a creature and shoves them back five feet, which means they leave the threatened range of an ally that's beside you would they get an opportunity attack against the monster okay because they leave the threatened space because you pushed them away so in a fight everyone is constantly watching for a chance to strike an enemy who is fleeing or passing by okay um, such a strike is called an opportunity attack you can make an opportunity attack when a hostile creature you can see moves out of your reach so if they're invisible or you can't see them you can't make the attack so you can't be blind uh to make the opportunity attack, use your reaction to make one melee attack against a provoking creature. Right, got it. The attack occurs right before the creature leaves your reach. Okay, so they don't actually leave the space until you actually make the attack. And then they move back after that, if they're able to, that is. You can avoid... Um, provoking an opportunity attack by taking the disengage action. You can also you also don't provoke an opportunity to attack, and this is important, when you teleport. So if you teleport, you do not provoke attacks of opportunity. This came up um, in the rules glossary recently for Unearthed Decana. And I did not know why they needed to actually redefine this or clarify this, because it's in the rules already. It's there. Teleportation does not provoke attacks of opportunity. Or when someone or something moves w moves with you, moves you without using your movement. Okay, so in other words, you're not using the monster's movement when you shove them back five feet as the part of the shove. Okay, they have to use their movement, their action, or a reaction, and they're not using any of those because them being shoved back is not their reaction. Okay. The reaction is your opportunity attack, if you're making an opportunity attack, okay? Your shove is an action, but the monster has none of those involved, so it doesn't work. For example, you don't provoke an opportunity attack if an explosion hurls you out of a foe's reach, or if gravity causes you to fall past an enemy. The same thing applies. They don't need to give you a list of all the different things that would potentially do that. I think it's pretty clear here to me that no, um, shoving a creature away from another ally's threatened space would not mean you get an opportunity attack on them. Simple as that. Okay, let's uh, let's move on to the next question. Uh, dun, 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 dun. We seem to be getting through these questions pretty well. I haven't gotten caught up too much. Uh, so Sika answered that, answered that, keep it going. Here we go. So, Nick, your question. Cone spells can be funky to calculate as well, especially with um, half 
covered squares. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, it, it's actually not that funky. I, I wish, what I wish is I had like a template. I wanna, what I want to do is I want to I want to get a template and lay it down on the battle grid and show you what I mean. Uh, the problem is I don't even remember where my templates are. So let's let's do something here. Because the question around templates and you know whether you can actually do anything, I know this comes up a lot for people, but it's actually very very simple. And um, let me give me give me a second. people here we go this thing this is a template this template will help demonstrate what your question is all about okay and that is how much of the creature needs to be covered to be affected when you're dealing with uh, a cone or if you're dealing with say a, a circle I know this question comes up a lot for people so I have a tool here that allows me to actually demonstrate this uh, I don't know if you can necessarily see it that clearly, but um, I got it. I got this sent, sent to me specifically so that I could actually demonstrate this sort of thing to people. So this here is clear and see-through, and you'll notice on it it has different um, sizes. Okay, so there's a cone on it. Um, this is the 12-inch cone, and uh, you've got uh, your your radiuses. And so when you're using anything, so for example, if I'm using the whole thing, the whole template here, as long as part of the miniature is covered by it, it's affected. In the past, I think I did videos and I would say um, something like, you need to have half the miniature covered. Uh, but you'll find that the rules, as far as I remember, don't necessarily stipulate that requirement. And... <laughs> And uh, I think mainly because, and because there were some updates to this, I believe they put out, uh, there was a little bit of stuff in the Dungeon Master Guide, but they put out another book that actually went into this in a bit more detail, where they started talking about like area of effect. It's mostly around spell casting, frankly, because that's, that's when that comes up quite a lot, is like, you know, how much of the, how much is going to be affected, like the area of a spell. Um, or the area of an effect, or something like that. And um, I'm going to be talking about this next week, as it is um, funny Funny that the topic comes up. Targeting, okay, so there are different areas of effect. And what I will do is I will go to the cone section, and we'll go back to D&D &D Beyond, and I will uh, show you what I mean. Hey, where are we? Window, yeah, there we go. Transition over. D&D &D Beyond. Thank you, D&D &D Beyond. You have been so useful. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So the cone. A cone extends in a direction you choose from its point of origin. Okay. A cone, cone's um, width at a given point along its length is equal to the, the point's distance from the, the, from the point of origin. Basically, you 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 just think of a triangle, okay? That's your cone. A cone's area of effect specifies its maximum length. A cone's point of origin is not included in the area effect or um, the, the cone effects of in the cone's area of effect unless you decide otherwise. Now, the word "unless you decide otherwise" just said dungeon masters. You can kind of do what you like with this. So, so I've seen dungeon masters who stipulate that, you know, as long as half of the um, area covers the miniature, or if it long as part of the miniature is covered, 
mean, frankly, I think that's probably where we're going with this. Um, and then, of course, you know, if we can bring in uh, things like uh, total cover as well. But I, <laughs> I think you, you've got to be careful about trying to make this more complicated than it needed to be. Uh, and, and ultimately, a, a lot of the time, we don't really focus on the, the point of origin. I think the question is, like, how much do you need to cover the miniature by? And if they cover the miniature by um, partially, then that's enough to, to make sure that they are affected. Yeah. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on to the next question. I think that's, um, that's answered that question fairly clearly. We have done that. Let's move over to the next thing. Um, next, who is up? Yeah, so Nick, don't worry about half covered squares. Half covered or a little, or just part of the covered, and I would just, I would just let it work, okay? <laughs> Brian Bucklin. Hello, Brian, how are you? It's been a while. Nice to have you back. Uh, <laughs> now, I'm just trying to... Do you know one of the things that I struggle with is trying to remember who is still a patron. And I'm pretty sure Brian was at one point, but I don't think he is now. Okay, all right, cool. Really, okay, so what do you got here? Um, or could be referred uh, referring to Pathfinder where it takes an action to raise a shield to get its AC bonus. Yeah, you don't need to raise your shield to get it. If, as long as you've got the shield on, it's con it's part of your AC. Fender, your question: Could a character be covered, um, um, be cover, um, be cover for another party member from ranged attacks? Okay, all right. Well, we can. Yes, they can. Um, and there is there is there is actually a section in there. You just come, hi, Pale Rider. If you just jumped in to hit the like button, you've got to go back to work. I totally understand. That's fine. That's all cool. Uh, let me see if I can just, I'm going to just put this over here. There's a lot of stuff around me right now. So, <laughs> uh, Climbing onto a larger creature. Oh, my gosh. Now, that's a tough question. Let's get to Fendar's question. And this is, this rule, this, uh, this question is around the cover rules. And this comes up quite a lot, right? You, it, if, if you're not careful about how you line yourself up, a lot of people don't even use the cover rules, to be fr frankly. Like, a lot of people don't even care what the cover rules are, which is fine. That's, that's all right. So, uh, let's go to first D&D uh, &D Beyond, since I've got the cover rules up there. And under the cover rules, the section you're looking for is half cover. A target with half cover has a plus two bonus to armor class and a dexterity saving throw. Okay, so either one of those. We already know this, so I've already discussed it. A target has half cover if an obstacle blocks at least half the body. So between half and three quarters, but not right up to three quarters. Three quarters would be three quarters cover. That's different. So at least, at least half the body has to be covered. The obstacle might be a low wall, a large piece of furniture, a narrow tree trunk, or a creature where the creature is an enemy or a friend. So the convention, as it happens, is that if you have a creature of, say, small size or medium size, and you are medium size, then they would provide half cover, which means to shoot past your allies might be a bit of a pain in the butt because <laughs> the, they're, they're in the way. Uh, so you have to maneuver yourself so you don't have them in the way. So let me demonstrate a little bit for you uh, by going over to our battle grid, okay? Let me set up a situation for you here so that it's, it's nice and clear. I will remove them. That will just distract you. We'll remove that. And we have like a fighter, say. Yeah. And we'll get rid of you. So we're make, making a ranged attack. Now here is where your problem might start to um, crop up. If you have a bunch of goblins that are attacking, and they're here, 
get rid of them. And you want to shoot past your allies. So they, they form like a wall here. So right now, to shoot past them, to try and hit any of these goblins that are here, any of these goblins, your party members are actually in the way. And that's because they are in the way. And they actually provide cover for the goblins. So the goblins, instead of having an armor class of 15 with a shield and their, their melee weapon, which is usually a scimitar or a short sword, a uh, scimitar, isn't it? Uh, right now, they have an armor class of 17 because they get a plus two, correct? That's what we're dealing with here. But there's an easy way to fix this problem. Is one, you get your players to move out of the way or you move to the side so you don't have to worry about that. So if we move to the side, 5, 10, 15, well, I can now shoot that goblin or the front goblin because there's no longer somebody standing in the way. Okay? How far do I need to move over to be able to get a clear line on them so there isn't going to be cover involved? Well, first off, if I'm going to move across, I don't have to move very far to be able to get... I can measure from the corner of that square. The corner of that square to here. And that pretty much says, okay, I can probably, I can probably do that shot and hit uh, without going through his square I can probably hit this um this goblin pretty easily okay so but what you wouldn't do is shoot the goblins at the back because the front goblins provide cover to them a lot of people don't worry about that sort of thing um it's really up to you I I think ultimately I think the dungeon master does set it out reasonably well as to how cover works there are some diagrams there so absolutely yes um, enemies and allies can do that there is a situation that can arise now this may come up for you it may not but when, when you're dealing with a large creature um, and I don't remember the exact location where you will find the information I know it's it's completely in the wrong location to make sense but if you have like a, um, a say an owl bear and there's a bunch of little creatures inside in front of them blocking yeah and you want to shoot the owl bear because the owl bear is classified as being large you don't have to worry about the fact that the goblins are in front because they don't they don't they don't uh, they're not tall enough they're not big enough to to actually stop you um, hitting the owl bear with no penalty so when you're shooting past a creature, it depends on the size of that creature, and it depends on the size of the creature in front of you. So yeah, if you are small size or medium size, shooting past small or medium um, creatures to another small or medium creature is going to be a problem. If you're dealing with um, uh, shooting at a large or huge creature and there's small or medium creatures in front of them, it's not going to be an issue. So if I even if I took away the goblins... I'm pretty sure you will, if, if I remember right, that even if you were shooting past, say, something like a um, a bugbear, which is medium size, so if we have a bunch of bugbears here, you still wouldn't have to worry about a, a penalty, even though the miniatures look like they're certainly much larger and cover more than half, okay? But I'm pretty sure that's the, the concept behind that. I can't remember where that section is, though. Okay, all right. We've, we've dealt with that. Let's uh, let's move back to my face and continue answering questions. We have just under 15 minutes before I have to leave. Um, how about using guerrilla fighting? John Fraser. Hello, John Fraser. How are you? Um, so... Sammy 3D, what about climbing onto a large creature like Legolas? Okay, so now we're talking about the Dungeon Master Guide. There are rules on climbing onto creatures in the Dungeon Master Guide. I think they are shit. <laughs> okay, um, so I mean I could refer you to the Dungeon Master Guide. I could show you the page section if we really wanted to. I kind of feel like if I even if I do that, I'm giving you information that I don't even agree with. Like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Um, I don't even know if I can find that page number that quickly as it is, uh, considering that 
there's a lot of that is um, advanced adjudication <laughs> and, and, and not, not exactly the, the simplest thing to find. Um, do I want to even bother going there? I suppose it was going to come up at some point. So we, we I suppose let's let's see if I can find this setting, silly thing. Small groups, new players, uh, ignoring dice, middle, da, da da da. How often do you have situations where people actually climb onto larger creatures? Um, quite often for me, when I do this, uh, the creature is so large that it makes no sense to have any major mechanics involved because the the, the monster itself is actually terrain now. Do you know what I mean? It can, sometimes it's easier just to deal with it. As, uh, you're dealing with terrain. It's it's not like... <laughs> uh, okay, let's see. Uh, inspiration. Oh, this is going to take me forever to find everything. Um, exploration using maps. Combat, tracking, social, indifferent. Uh so the new stuff in the rule scroll glossary is just basically ripping stuff out of the dungeon master guide by the way people if you hadn't figured that one out all those numbers and charts are already they already exist it's nothing it's not new so if you thought they did, did something fantastic not really <laughs> objects uh come on quakes combat here we go hiding visible indexing tracking monster hit points Using conditions, monster critical hits. Uh, I know there is a section on adjudicating area effects. Um, mobs. Oh. It is just so hard to find all the stuff sometimes. Flanking, optional diagonals, facing rules. Do we really want to talk about... I, I think a few of you were trying to get me to talk about facing rules, and I, I kind of... I trying to, I escaped that one, didn't I? <laughs> um, yeah. I don't know. Is there... Is there a, I don't think D&D Beyond has got a particularly good search engine for finding these things. Not that I remember seeing one anyway. Sample crawling, blah blah blah, crafting, madness, going mad. I know there is a section on it, but for the life of me, it'll take me forever to find it. Non combat. Nah, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be able to find it. Look, seriously, the easiest way I've dealt with uh, climbing onto a creature, and this is not official, is I just have them use their movement. They jump on. Uh, once they're on, uh, sometimes they'll say they stab their weapon if they've got a, a pointy um, piercing weapon or slashing weapon, but a stabby weapon. So they can stab it and make the attack and they use the weapon to hold on to. And so I just get them to make an acrobatics check along with their attack or their movement um, each round. And then I will also probably get them to do another one. And it's not an extra action or anything like that. I just let them do that. Um, every time the monster moves around, it is going to potentially throw them off. So they need to make another um, acrobatics check to stay on otherwise off they come and fall to their death or crushed underneath feet something like that uh, I don't know that that necessarily answers your question Sammy 3D but yeah and I can't find the rules for it if I if I can find it next time um, well we can discuss it gnomes hiding behind a half hawk a gnome hiding behind a half hawk yes you could have a gnome hide behind a half orc. That would be quite reasonable. <laughs> it can be done. Uh, <laughs> I think the half orc is certainly big enough to hide behind for a gnome. How about using gorilla fighting? So I, mm, so I, a gorilla fighting, you're talking about hit and run and using cover. Is that what you're talking about? Or are you talking about real gorilla fighting where you... Um, make a quick attack strategically and then withdraw. Um, I don't know, your your question isn't defined well enough for me to be able to do very much with it. If you're wanting me to explain how to use guerrilla tactics with the nimble escape for the goblin, I'm happy to do that. Uh, next. Cover versus concealment. Jean. Cover versus concealment? Well... The 
the one of them one of them actually provides you with an armor bonus and a bonus to your dexterity saving throw uh, both can be used to hide behind uh, although most of them in the rules for 5e you're really using concealment like light obs um, um, obscurity heavy obscurity they're going to be changing all the rules around this and they're defining it all as it is uh, but that's not here yet do what makes sense do you know what I mean the difference is that I mean, you can have you can have a creature that is heavily obscured in darkness, but they don't have cover. That doesn't mean you know where they are. It just means that you can't see them, right? Heavy obscurity. Light obscurity is say you you're you know the the light is dim and you can't see them clearly. Um, so there's a there's a better chance of missing them or not seeing all the details. I think that's what we're talking about in terms of concealment, light obscurity, heavy obscurity. I, you've 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 gone cover versus concealment question mark, and and I, it's it's such a broad concept. I don't know how I can deal with that. You have to go now. I'll see you later, Fender. You've probably already gone. Super late. I bet it is. Okay, I'll see you later, um, Seeker. You've probably already gone as well. Now, uh, must be a larger um larger size. Dex check, then uh, it's difficult terrain. You're talking about, yeah, hit and run, flanking, ambushing, like a Native American uh, warfare tactics. I don't think this is the right place to do it. Dungeons and Dragons 5e rules don't really support it as much as you might think. Um, the, I mean, at least one of the things that you do benefit from with Dungeons and Dragons with regard to actually engaging in a fight with a monster or monsters is that uh, you can you can do a variety of different things and you can use cover whereas before when we played the game you know you moved you made your attack and you were stuck but now you can actually do a bit more which is great I mean I'm glad that that's there so for example let me just um let me just grab some miniatures. I'm going to just show you what I mean. And this is the sort of play that you should be engaging in, people. If you're not already doing this, you should be doing this. So let's put some goblins here. Let's assume that they are hiding behind these, these posts. I mean, we can put them on the diagonal if you would prefer, but they are hiding essentially behind the posts. Don't worry about line of sight. This is just to demonstrate, okay, what we're dealing with here is more about uh, positioning, okay? I'm just using this as a physical representation. We can have this goblin here ducking down. Yep, it's ducking down. Yep. But they're all, they're all hiding in some way. Now, if you want to do something and actually be effective, one of the smartest things that you can do is, as a um, an archer, is you can move position... Make an attack, move position, make an attack. So if you have, say for example, the goblin moves out and makes itself obvious and it's your turn and they're still there, then you would make an attack. If you have more than one attack, you can make an attack and then move into the cover and use it. Now, you don't just because you didn't take the hide action doesn't matter. The cover still provides you some protection. So the foliage for a dungeon master might be classified as half cover. Or they might say that it's, it's dense enough that we can consider it three quarters cover. It doesn't just provide concealment, okay, it also provides cover. And then of course, um, that's for one attack, but if we decide we want to make more than one attack because there's like more than one target here, so we'll put some goblins out in the um, in the open now. We could, if we were here, and we have 30 feet of movement on our turn, we could move over to here, 5, 10, make a shot here. If we've got a second attack, we can move again, 15, 20, take the second shot here at this goblin, and then move into cover. Okay, 
and and then we're done. So you can move between your attacks, all of them. It's it's in the rules there. It's nice and obvious. And um, one of the most common things that you should be doing is moving in and out from cover. If you are behind cover, and this is what the goblins would be doing, sensible goblins, when they're using all of their tactics, what they would be doing is they would hide behind a pillar or in some some bushes. They would move out, use their bow, shoot the player characters, move back because they've only used part of their movement, and then use their nimble escape bonus action to hide again. Uh, goblins are one of the most efficient and effective uh, guerrilla warfare uh, monsters there are, just because of nimble attack or nimble escape. Okay, it gives them the, the ability to hide as a bonus action. They can also disengage, which is very deadly, deadly uh, and, and nasty. I'm going to cover stuff like this in the future in monster combat tactics, but now I think that covers that question reasonably well. Okay, let's go back to here. Um, I'm going to have to wrap this up pretty quickly. Uh, flanking, flanking usually works to the benefit of the dungeon masters, by the way. Usually the dungeon master has more monsters than the players have characters, so yeah, Flanking is a, is um, is a. I'll come of that. Cover that another day, okay? Because I'm going to run out of time. But it, I've shown you a little bit. Okay, so uh, let's uh, let's roll on out because that that's that's me. I have run out of time. I'm going to have to go to work. It's going to be one of those days. <laughs> it's going to be one of those days. Um, the good news is, come back next week. I will be covering magic, and so I will do some demonstration. And I'm hoping that people will ask me to actually demonstrate some stuff around casting spells, if that's what you need, or any questions you have, I will answer them as best I can in the, the Q&A, okay? And of course, demonstrate where I need to. So, uh, let's get out of here. Uh, I just want to say thank you to my patrons who support me to make sure that I can actually keep running this class every week and for everything that they do. Uh, and I want to thank everybody who's been part of my live streams, providing questions and answers and feedback and also just watching, because that's really helpful, it does make a big difference to me, and watching the replays and my edited videos. Uh, wherever you are in the world, whether it be the morning, the afternoon, or the night, or the wee wee early morning, please look after yourself, your family, and your friends, be nice to your neighbours, and hey, till next time, keep rolling those 20s. Hi Ben and hi Irene, how are you?